Okay, we will get started. So we have a really fun workshop today. So today what we're going to do is we are going to take a kind of an introductory look at APIs and specifically how you can work with APIs to access data. So essentially how you can communicate with an outside service that will send you data and then how in JavaScript and React, how you can first make that request, but then walk through all of the steps you need in order to look at the data, parse out the data, and then render it onto the screen. So right now I have the finished version of the application that we are going to be building. And so this is going to call an API with various posts and then it's the and each one of these posts exists on a different application. So as you can see, this is kind of the source. This is where it's stored on this daily Smarty application. It has content. It has these different category names as all of this. And we are going to be able to build in less than an hour a system that is going to be able to pull in that data and it's going to create our own version of that. And so I think that's going to be really good APIs for development students. If you've never worked with them before, they can seem a little bit intimidating. And so one of my biggest goals that I have in this guide is that you will be able to, by the end of it, not just be able to work with APIs and, you know, call an outside service and render the data on the screen, you're also going to be able to not really be as intimidated about them. You'll, you can create a mental model for how they will work. So let's get started. And if you want to follow along, there's a couple ways of doing that. One, you can follow along by literally trying to follow all of the code that I'm typing out. That sometimes can be a little bit frustrating, and so and you may actually miss some things. So what my approach is, especially if you've never done this type of thing before, is instead simply watch it the first time and then come back afterwards and then follow along, and then you'll also have access to the recording. So you can go through, you can hit pause when you need to, and then you can actually code along uh, excuse me, as I'm doing it. So that is kind of the approach I'd recommend. Now, let me grab us the code here. So I'm going to share this inside of the chat so that you can have access to it. And so we have this link, and this is to the GitHub link. And uh, Rodney, your question on where you can find the recording, I believe Dr. Finn will send that out. I will be publishing it on my own YouTube channel as well. But it's also on our live events page on the home, uh, on the website. Yes. And then here you will also, and, uh, the language we're doing this in, uh, Jason, we're going to be doing this in JavaScript with TypeScript and using React for that. So now if you are wanting to follow along, the way to do that is we have two different versions of the application. On the master branch, this is the final version. So this is exactly what we're looking at right here. If you want to follow along, you can click and switch to the starter branch that's going to give you the base elements that you need in order to get started. And there you can simply download the code. You can, if you're familiar with using the terminal, you can clone it locally and go from there. But the starter branch is going to be how we are going to be starting as well. We can walk through here the steps or I should say kind of the skills that you're going to have by the end of this. So by the end of this, you're going to be able to build a function that retrieves data from an API. You're going to be able to implement a JSON parsing system that's going to extract that data. Then we're going to be able to populate the data in our application 
and then we're going to be able to render that on the screen. So we'll knock out each one of these objectives and I'll be crossing them off the list as we go about doing that. So first and foremost, I'm going to switch to the starter version here. So now we are on the starter version of the code and I will start the server up. And as I'm doing this, I'm also going to shrink this pane here so that we can, we don't have to keep switching back and forth between the two. So I'm going to put this on the right hand side. This guide's not about media queries or anything. So uh, we don't really have to worry about it being mobile friendly. We already did a whole workshop dedicated just to that. So you'll know how to do that when you need to. So let's get started. I'm going to hit refresh and you can see we have no data. We simply have this coming soon element here. So very first thing we're going to do is I want to take a look at what an API endpoint is, because if you've never worked with them before, that part by itself might be kind of intimidating. I know it was the first time I heard about APIs. So hopefully this will kind of dissuade any of your fears around that and give you some clarification on it. And at the end of the day, all this is, all an API endpoint is, it's a website. That's it. Nothing too weird or crazy or anything like that. So if you paste this in, this is the website. And this is the exact URL we're going to go to. So first and foremost, when you think about what an API is, an API is a website. Now, it's a website that is going to have data organized in a way so that an application can communicate with it instead of a person. So for example, if we were to go to the same exact website, you'd go to dailysmarty.com. This website has HTML, has CSS, has all of those kinds of things. This is what's being rendered. For an API, we wrap our API, and for the most part in modern applications, you wrap up and you render your data using the JSON format. Now, if you go to this API, and I will also place this in the chat as well. If you go to this, it's going to look a little bit different for you. In, I have a little JSON tool. Yours is going to look something like this. Don't worry, that's perfectly fine. Uh, you can always Google something like uh, if you're using Chrome, it's like a Chrome extension for JSON, and it just formats the JSON like this. So let's take a look at what we have here, because this is the very first, I, kind of the first high level idea of what this API is going to give us. It's giving us data. It's giving us a set of posts. Now, this is not, this is specific to the application. This is going to be different for every API you work with. So yours might say guides. It might say invoices. It might say videos. It, it could be whatever the API creator decided to call that. So that's the first thing. Then inside of this, so we get an object, and the object has one key, which is called posts. Inside of post, that gives us an array. And if you're coming from Python, that you could think of it as it gives us a list. And anytime I say object in JavaScript, uh, that is a dictionary in Python. Anytime I say array in JavaScript, that's going to be a list. High level, it's the exact same thing. They're just different types of collections. So here we have post, which gives us an array of objects. Inside of each one of these objects, we have these attributes like an ID, a title, content. We have created at. We have each one of these things. And what we're going to be able to do is we're going to start extracting that data and that is what we're going to do and what we have to do in order to have this rendered onto the screen so let's get started with that i'm going to copy this url close this window out here and let's see the first thing that we need to do well the first thing is when this application loads up we need to create a trigger we want to say when this app loads, when this component loads, we want to call this API. 
if you have watched my uh, my workshop on React hooks, then you might remember the way you can do that is with the use effect hook. So we're going to start with that. Now I'm using TypeScript. If you're using vanilla JavaScript, then you're going to have a slightly different syntax. I'll show you both just so you can tell the difference. So if you're using vanilla JavaScript, you'll type use effect. And then inside of here, you'll pass in parens with a fat arrow function, curly brackets, and that's the way you'd write use effect. In TypeScript, the only difference is we'll say react dot use effect, and that's all we need to do. Now, another thing here is we need to make sure inside of use effect that right after the end of the curly brackets, we add a comma, and in this case, we pass in some empty brackets. If we do not do that, use effect it does not simply run one time. Use effect listens for changes. And if you don't have those brackets there, what's going to happen is literally any change, things you may not think of, like the mouse moving or something being clicked, it would go out and call that API. That is not what you want. That is how you take down a server and how you would create a bunch of memory issues. So you do not want that. You only want this to run one time in our case. So let's just test this out. Let's make sure that this is working. I'm going to add a console log statement here and we'll say loaded just like this. Hit save and let's open up the console just to make sure all of this is working. And there we go. It says loaded. So everything there is working the way you would think. We have the ability to have a callback and that is triggered when we want it to be. So that's the first thing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a function that we wanna call right here. So whenever this load component loads up, we wanna say, go get us that data. Now I added in the starter code, I added this library called Axios. So what I'm about to show you will only work if you've added Axios. Axios is a library, it's a NPM library that allows you to make API calls. It's not required to work with APIs to use this. There are all kinds of different libraries that allow for this. Axios is simply the one that I personally use the most, and so that's what we're using. Axios has all kinds of cool functions that will allow us to make these API calls. So let's start with creating this function. I'm going to create a function, and let's just call it get data. And this is going to be a fat arrow function that will not take in any arguments. And I'm going to first come up to the top and say, I want to import Axios from Axios, just like this. And now we are going to call this Axios instance, and we're going to pass in that URL. So I'm going to create a variable here, and I'm just going to call it endpoint. And let's paste in that API. And this has to be exact, so you have to make sure that you have the full URL here. And then inside of Axios, I'm going to simply pass in that variable of endpoint. So this is exactly the same as if I pass that in. So now that we have that endpoint in there, the way Axios works is Axios returns what's called a promise. If you have never worked with a promise before, don't worry. They can be kind of confusing, but in our case, a promise works exactly the same way a promise works in real life. If you come up to me and you and I promise you something, I say, I am going to buy you lunch, then what's going to happen? I'm either going to, at some point, buy you lunch or I'm not. That's the way a promise works in real life. In JavaScript, it works exactly the same way. When we say we are getting a promise, it means that something is going to happen, or it's not, and we get to define what we want to have happen after that promise gets returned. So in this case, with the syntax you use is you say Axios, pass in the URL, and then you say then. That is something that is specific to how promises work. So we're saying whenever that promise gets returned, in our case, we're making the API call. We're creating this promise. 
that is on a completely different server. We can't call this in real time. That's why a promise is being used. And we're saying, whenever this happens, give me back the data and I want to do some things. So in this case, we're going to start off by simply looking at this data in the console. So I'm going to say then, and you get a response back. And now the response here, this could be named anything. So this is a syntax I personally like to use, but you could use literally anything. So I could call this R, I've seen people just call it uh, res. This name is up to you. I like to call it response because that's exactly what it is. Now this is one because I'm using TypeScript. I have, I'm just gonna define a basic type of any here. And so I'm gonna say response any and then a fat arrow function. So if you look at the syntax right here, what are we giving to the then function? This is just a callback function. It's, uh, it's an anonymous function. This is the same as, you know, if we created some function and, you know, passed in some data like response, and then we said, I want you to do something here. That's exactly all we're doing is we're passing that in. And if we have time at the end of this workshop, I'm actually going to show you how you can refactor code. So it looks really pretty and it is easier to read. So we're getting that response. So for right now, let's just console log this out. So I'm gonna say response and let's just take the response and I know it's gonna give us data. So I'm gonna say response.data. Let's also, let's talk about what happens going back to our example on if we met and I said, I'm gonna buy you lunch, I promise you that. Well, there's two things that could happen. I'm either going to at some point make good on my promise and buy you lunch, or I'm not going to, and something's gonna happen and I'm not gonna do that. Well, when that happens, that's what we call an error and we need to be able to catch errors. So what we can do is say dot catch and what we're gonna be expecting is whenever an error happens, then we want to be able to do something with that error. So in this case, I'm just going to, once again, just console log this out and say an error happened. And then you can also print out in the console what that error is. I can tell you just from experience, this error is usually not very helpful because if there is an error that's happening and it gets caught here, typically it is, it's, just something happened on the server, like a server error. And there's not really a lot you can do with that. Uh, usually you'll just turn off the loader and print something out on the screen and say, hey, something happened, please try again. Okay, so now that we have this, we have our response, we're printing this out. Now, instead of in our use effect hook, instead of just console logging out that that's loaded, now let's call our function. So I'm gonna say get data and call it with parens. Okay, let's hit save and let's see if this is working. So if we open up the console, there we go, look at that. We now have data. Those same posts, that same array of objects that we were looking at in the browser, we now have access to all of that. Notice that we have our title, we have the content, we have all of those things. That's pretty cool. I, I love that. That shows just really, hopefully, how straightforward it is. We have a URL, and instead of going to it in the browser, we're telling our program to go to it. And it's getting the data returned in a way that we can actually work with it. So that's pretty cool. Let's talk about how we can work with promises here and how we can essentially create a workflow because we are working with what's called asynchronous type of behavior, which means that a user comes to our site right here and it loads up, but we do not have instant access to the posts. It may only take us a split second to get the post return, but that's still a split second where we are not gonna have any of that data. So a really common thing to do is to set up a loader. So that's the first thing that we can do is we're gonna use the use state hook with React and we're gonna set up a loading state. So I'm gonna say const and using brackets, I'll say 
is loading and then set is loading then react dot use state and then by default this is going to be true because anytime this component loads up we want it to be in a loading state so by default this is going to be true now what we can do inside of our promise inside of that then block we can say when this data comes to us then i want to set is loading to false and i also want to do the same thing if an error occurs now what can we do on the screen well we can listen for these changes here so i can create a variable here and we'll just call it content you can call it anything you want but i'm going to call it content and i'm going to add a conditional here and so i'm going to use a ternary operator for that so i'm going to say if is loading is true and i'm going to use a ternary operator this is the exact same of me saying something like if is loading you know then do something and if not then you know something else just in case you're not that familiar with ternary operators that's all we're doing we're saying if is loading is true then i want to return a div that says loading if this was a big application we might do something like you know, bring in some kind of animated loader or something like that to run for right now we can just have the text here and so we're going to say is loading true if not then i want to show some data so in this case we haven't actually stored the data in any state so we can't do anything with it yet but we'll just say data like data is coming soon and now inside of what gets returned by this component then we can just pass in this content variable and that's it so hit save and let's see if that's working and yes that worked beautifully you can hit refresh to test it out you'll see it says is loading or it'll say loading for a split second and then it shows data so hit refresh and look at that that is working perfectly that's the exact behavior we want now why is that important well there's a couple of reasons one is it's important to work and integrate loading states into your application because it's helpful for your users how many times have you been on an application a poorly made application where you go to it and it seems like nothing is happening and then all of a sudden a bunch of things appear on the screen that's a bad user experience it's and because when that happens what it means is that they are making api calls and you just don't know it because it's all happening in the background it's a much better user experience to say hey just hold on tight we're getting some data we're going to show it in a second the other reason why it's important to have a loading state is because imagine that i built out the entire user interface here and it expects to get an array of these posts it is going to air out if i simply try to call that render process because i'm going to say hey render out these posts before the posts actually exist and so you can't do that you need to create this type of workflow just like this so that is what we have there we now have a loading state Another thing that I've seen with some applications that they do poorly is when an error occurs, they forget to turn the loader off. And that can be kind of annoying where you can have a little spinner still going while it's giving error messages. That's not a great user experience. So that is what, make sure you put that, any changes to the loader, make sure you put it in the successful resolution, but also catch it with any errors and update it. Okay, now that we have that, now we can actually get that data. We can get those posts. So let's create a, another piece of state here and we'll call it posts. You can call it anything you want. So we'll say set posts. And then by default, this is going to be an empty array. And so now what we can do is inside of this response, we can add i like to add a conditional here so technically i could do something like this i could say set posts and then response data posts 
And if you're wondering on how I know how to do that, all we're doing is we're treating this, this like a normal JSON object. This is just a regular object. And so if this seems a little confusing, what could be really helpful is actually to kind of look at this in the console. Let me zoom in here. And so let's say that we actually created a, a variable called response. So I'm gonna say, let's create a response. And then this is going to be an object. And inside of this object, we're gonna have data. And then inside of data, then we're going to have some posts, exactly like what we have right now. And then inside of posts, we'll just put one object in here. So we'll just say an ID of one, two, three, and then a title of, hey, close that off, close that one off, and then close one more off, and that should be all we need. Okay, so now we have this response. That's exactly like what we're getting. So I can call response, dot data and look at that i have posts then i can call response dot data dot posts and there we go this is our array so that's all that's happening so i know that if you've never worked with apis or you know built out this kind of workflow before it can be a little bit intimidating but really it, that's why it's so important to get the fundamentals down with working with javascript or any programming language because at the end of the day all of these concepts go back to the fundamentals those things like data structures and iterating and doing those kinds of things that's all we're doing here so if you understand how a javascript object works then you already technically have the knowledge you need in order to build this out because all we're doing is response as an object data is an object and posts is an array that's how we're able to get that now one thing i like to do is i don't like to be assumptuous with this because say that something happened on the server and it didn't return an error but for some reason or another it didn't return posts and maybe it returns something else well, I don't want to set the data. I don't want to try to call posts unless I have it. So what I can do is set up a conditional here. And I can say if response.data.posts, then I can set that. It's still going to stop loading, but here you, you could do something like return an error. In this case, we'll just console log this out. We'll say an error happened. And then in a real life application, we had built something out like rendering that on the screen. This one should hopefully work, so we shouldn't even be able to mimic that. But now we have our post set in our local state. So now what can we do? How can we work with those posts? Well, I wanna show you a pretty cool little trick here. When working with an API, you can look at the data in the console. Another way that you can look at it though, that's pretty neat, is you can use JSON stringify. This is a really helpful little tool for when you're building out APIs. If you use pre-tags, so what a pre-tag is in HTML is it's HTML's way of trying to render code, like programming code. So you can use a pre-tag and then using curly brackets inside of here, call a JavaScript function, JSON dot, stringify i hate well the browser does that or the code editor does it okay there we go so json stringify pass in our posts array and then this one you just kind of have to know by doing it say null two so this is not the best function for uh in terms of how it was designed because technically you don't really know how to use this until you have memorized it but if you do it enough times, I promise you will memorize it. What this does is it takes JSON, in our case, post is a JSON object, and then it converts that into a string. And the reason why that's helpful for debugging is because if I tried to call post by itself, so in other words, if I just went into this layout and I said, hey, show me the posts, 
that's going to throw a big error because you can't just call JSON data directly in React. And so it doesn't know how to process that. But what you can do is you can convert posts into a string, which is what JSON stringify does. Uh, the null and the two, this just allows for you to space it out so it'll look pretty. So this makes it easier to read. Hit save here and look at that. This is a way of actually getting the data in object form and having it rendered right here on the screen. And I can't take credit for this little trick. Uh, one of my friends, uh, he's the uh, creator of React Router, very, uh, my name Michael Jackson, very talented developer, not the other Michael Jackson, obviously. And uh, he, is, he is all brilliant, brilliant guy. And I saw him doing this and I loved it. And I've been doing this ever since. It's a great way of having the ability to access your data right on the screen without having to put it in the console. So this makes it easy. I can look at it and see, oh, I have an ID. I have a title, a content. I have all of those things. I can even see that which ones are arrays and you know those kinds of things. So that is really helpful. So now we have all of that built out. We have, we're almost there. We have our data. We're showing it on the screen. Now what we can do is we can actually start to iterate over this. So that's going to be the next step. So I'm going to create a function here that's going to be called post render. So I'm going to say const post render. And then this is going to take the posts and then it's going to map over them. So I'm going to say posts map. And then it's going to, uh, the way the map works, I believe I've talked about this in a previous uh, in a previous lecture, but I'll just show you super quick if you've never used it before. So if I have something like, uh, uh, let's see, just numbers, it can be anything though. And if I have a set of numbers like one, two, and three, like this, numbers.map would allow me to access that number so we can just say num or something like that, pass in a function, and we could say something like num times two, and look at that. That is really nice and easy. So if you ever had to multiply each one of those numbers by, some, by something else, in this case two, then we, by using the map function, you're able to do that. Now, the other cool thing about this is this returns the value. So if I say data, now this data variable has this new array with the updated numbers in it. Why is that helpful? Well, that's exactly what we're looking to do here. That's why the map function is going to be one of your best friends and you're going to be using it constantly when you're building out React applications because this is a function you use whenever you have an array and you want to iterate over the data and then make changes to it. In our case, we're going to create divs and title tags and all kinds of things like that. And then we're going to want to return that new object. So right now, the first time that map goes through, it's going to get this first object here. Well, we don't really want to show this JSON data. Instead, we want to get a div. We might want to add a class name to that div. Then inside of that div, we will want to call the title. And then inside of that, we'll want to do content and different things like that. And map will iterate over, then it'll store the new data, same way it stored the duplicated data in the console a second ago. It's now going to pass back in those div elements and titles and all of those things. And it's going to store it inside of post render. And then we can call that from anywhere else. In our case, we're going to call it from within our content function. So inside of here, much like when we were using the console and we had, let me go back up to it. When we called num, what this represents is whatever the value is at that current iteration. So the first time 
because our numbers were one, two, and three. The first time, num equaled one. Second time, num equaled two, and so on and so forth. So with the way this works is we need to give some kind of variable. You can name this whatever you want. I'm going to call mine post. And then inside of here, we are going to then return some JSX data, which is going to look like divs and those things. Now, there's a couple ways of returning this data. If I use curly brackets right here, then I have to say return and then you know, put in these div items. And I'll do this first, and then I'll show you a slightly easier way of doing it. So I'm going to put in the div, and then inside of here, I'm going to get post.title. And then we need to call our post render. We're going to replace what we have here with JSON stringify. I'm just going to call post render like this, hit save. And there you go. Look at that. Here are our titles. Now, obviously, we still have a lot more work to do to format those, but this is working. Uh, now, there's even a better way of writing this. The reason why we had to use this return is because of how map works. Now, if you notice, when we were using map in the console, we didn't have to type the word return in. So this is what's called an explicit return. We can use an implicit return. The syntax for that is instead of curly brackets, just use parentheses. Now, if you do that, we're going to be able to get the exact same behavior. So if I hit save here, that's all working. Beautiful. So everything there is working exactly the way we'd want it to. There's a little bug or a little issue that we have right now that's silent unless you open up the console. So if we switch back and notice we have this big warning here. It says each child in a list should have a unique key prop. So what that means is React is amazingly brilliant at memory management. So when we create a list of posts or a list of anything, React takes all of that data and it stores it in memory and it creates what's called the virtual DOM. That gives you the ability to make changes to that data and React keeps a reference to those data points. So let's say instead of posts, or no, actually we can use the same example here because it's a, neat, a nice visual. Say that we added a little voting button where you could upvote or downvote one of these posts. And we wanted to give the ability to click on it. And then we would create another API call. It would call the API and it would say, hey, user XYZ just clicked upvote on this post. And then it would switch it to thumbs up or thumbs down and do whatever you'd want. Well, the way that React works is if you were to do that in this list of posts as it is right now, and you were to make a change, it would actually go through and it would re-render all of those posts. That is not a great way of doing it. The user may not even see the difference, but if you analyze the HTML, you'd see that React would go through and it would recreate all of those virtual DOM elements. That's not great for memory management. However, if you supply a key prop, a, you, and that has to be something that's unique. If you supply a key prop, what you're doing is you're giving React a unique identifier for that element, which means that when you make a change to that one post, it will only update that one. It won't re-render all the other ones. R that's very important for memory management. It's so important that that's why they put that big red warning there. So we can get rid of this by inside of this first div here, we can pass in a key and say post dot, and in our case, we have an ID. Yours might be a token or a UUID. It's every, every different uh, API is going to be different, but we have an ID. Whatever The only rule is you have to make sure it's unique. So our IDs are the database IDs, so they are unique. Now, if we switch back, Notice we no longer have that nasty warning message. And so this is working. So let's go get some of that other data. So we have the post title and 
I'm going to, I actually already put it and you already have it in your starter code. I wrote out some nice CSS styles for us. So we have a post container, a title, we have topics, and then a label. And so I figured you didn't want to watch me type all of that in manually. So I'm simply going to create these different elements and call them. So first and foremost, we have a class name of post, and I believe that was container. Yes, so just post container. And then this, you won't really see any major differences with just that. It just adds in some spacing. And then we have a title. So I can say div.title and Emmett will automatically create that for us, which is a nice handy little shortcut. Hit post title. And there we go. Now we have something that looks like a link. As you can see right now, it's not technically a link yet though. So we can switch this div tag to an A tag. And now what we can do is that URL or, or that API actually had a link that would point directly to it. So let me switch back to, let me grab the URL. So, that, and we also have, well, actually, yeah, we have it in the response. So we can look at the response just to get the name of this. So we have something called not post links, that's something else. We have URL for post. So what we can do is inside of this A tag, we can pass in an href and say post dot URL for post. And we can even do things like add a target and do this target underscore blank so that when someone clicks on one of these links, it'll open up a new tab automatically. So if you do that, everything looks the same, but now look, this is fully functional. So you click on any of these and they're going directly to the URL that we had. That is pretty awesome. So that's coming along really nicely. What is next on the list? If we look here and look at post, we have content. I'll save that for uh, in a minute, but we also have associated topics. This is where we can print out each one of these little topics. I think that, that would be cool to have them listed as labels. And the other reason I'm doing this, it's not really that important for to see it. It's because this shows you a very important task and you'll be able to do this now, is how can you work with nested collections. So here, this was pretty straightforward. We called post title. And that was simply a key inside of the post object. Well, what happens when you have something like an array that's inside of the object, like associated topics? Well, we can do the same exact task. So just like we are iterating over the posts, we can also iterate over a nested array. And you can do this as many times down the line as needed. Typically, it's pretty rare that you'd have to do this more than you know, two or three kind of nested parent-child relationships, but you can do anything that you want on that side. On In the CSS, I created a topics item, a little topics class. So I can say div.topics. And then inside of here, I can actually, or I can put a conditional here and I can say if post dot, and then this was, yes, associated topics. So in other words, if there are associated topics and I'll show you a cool little TypeScript thing, you can't do this in JavaScript, I don't believe, um, but you can say if there are any topics then, and the length of them, is greater than zero, then you can do some stuff. In our case, you can show the topics div. Um, now, if you're to do this in JavaScript, it's very simple. You just have to write a little bit more code. You could say something like if post.associated topics and post associated topics dot length is greater, this is just kind of a way of short circuiting it. Now, another very cool little tip on, uh, this is very helpful for React, is anytime 
that you have a ternary operator where you want to show something or perform some task if an item is true and if not then you don't care then you can actually use this syntax so this is the same uh, ternary operators can be confusing for uh, for new developers if you've never done it before uh, so a normal ternary operator would look something like this so we say if something is true or uh, we'll just make it easy say okay so we'll give name jordan and then we'll say if the name jordan or if the name's equal to jordan then you know do something and let's imagine a scenario where if it's jordan you want to do something and if not then return null or don't do anything well there's a way of short circuiting that anytime you have a ternary operator that looks like this you can actually short circuit it and just give two ampersands here and then that's going to do the exact same thing and that's what we're doing right here so we're saying that if we have associated topics then i want you to show those topics and then if not just skip over it entirely now let's also add in our iterator so just like we did post.map now what we can do is say post dot associated topics dot map and then each one of these topics is just a string so we can just say topic and then we'll return a div and then typescript some sometimes it'll force you to add in the data type so i'm going to say topic it's going to be a string you don't need to do that with javascript and then return a div in our case we need to make sure to add a key anytime you're doing map and iterating over and returning some jsx in react you need to do this so i'm going to say topic is the key because it's always going to be unique and then this class name is going to be label and then inside of the div itself then pass in the topic and let's see if this is working there we go that looks nice so you have each one of those topics now gets iterated on if it exists and look here's one that doesn't so that's how that works that that cool little check it's not horribly necessary in this case because topics doesn't have a predefined height so there's really no difference in adding that but i just wanted to show you that because there will be plenty of times where you want to say return some jsx but only under certain conditions and that's what we have here and then lastly we simply have to put the content now i'm going to show you something this is a little trick here I'm going to first show you the bad way of doing this and then or the kind of ugly way and then I'm going to show you a better way. And so lastly, we're going to add a div. I forget if I put uh, yeah, I don't yeah, I didn't put any content in there, so that's fine. And so we'll say post.content hit save and notice here that we're getting all of the html and that's on purpose that's what the api is supposed to do and there are going to be plenty of times where that is the case whenever you have html returned to you from the api you typically have two different options one is that you can take that html and you can render it out so there are plenty of libraries and in the portfolio application for a dev camp or in the in bottega i show how to do that it's pretty standard it's just a library call for react html parser pass in the content you'll take all of this data like the h3 here this heading tag it will actually create a h3 tag and render that here oh there are plenty of other times though where you don't want to do that and you want to say hey get rid of all of this and for that i do not have this memorized so i'm going to go to the final version of this and so you can see it not starter we want to go to master here and then inside of here let's see i have it in a post component 
And so I'm using the replace function and that's exactly what we have right here. So I'll copy it and then we'll kind of talk through it in a second. There we go. Okay, so instead of it saying just post content, what we can do is add a ternary operator once again. We're gonna say, if there is content, then I want you to pass it to this replace function. So what in the world's going on here? Don't worry if this is, uh, looks uh, like a completely different language to you. This is using what's called a regular expression to perform a match. Let me hit save and show you what it does first. And then we'll talk about exactly what the details are. So notice that got rid of all of those ugly tags. So what's going on here? Well, there are plenty of times when you are working with API data that you need to do data pre-processing and data cleaning. That's exactly what we're doing here. Replace is a JavaScript function that takes in two arguments. The first argument is a regular expression. What this is, is it is, it's technically like its own language and you create a matcher and it creates a pattern. In this case, this is a non-trivial one. I, uh, I would not write this just from scratch. Uh, you can Google HTML regular expression matcher and there are about 10 million of them that people have written and you can just use that. And that's exactly what I did. So here you're getting that regular expression pattern matching. And then what replace does is it says any time that you find something that matches this pattern, then I want you to just replace that with an empty string. So all of those tags, they're still there, but before they get rendered, they get ripped out. So that's what is happening there. And I wanted to include that because that's something that you're gonna need to do quite often when you're working with APIs because you're not always going to get perfect data. In fact, you'll very rarely ever get perfectly rendered data that's just set up for you to print out. You're usually gonna to wanna to do things like this where you need to be able to do some type of pre-processing one caveat, one thing you need to be careful of, make sure you always check the data. Notice here how many times, even in this little function or this little render function, see how many times I checked to verify that data existed? That is also incredibly important because there are gonna be so many times where you expect to get data that has XYZ type structure, it's set up in one way. And it may be like that 90% of the time, but for that other 10% where data is missing, if you try to call functions on that 10% of time, you could have the entire application blow up and you do not want that. And I, I've had that happen more times than I care to admit. And usually it's pretty embarrassing because I have had times where I've taken down an entire application all because I tried to run a formatting like capitalization function on some type of string. That's, you definitely don't wanna do that. You don't wanna to explain to your boss that the application went down because you were wanting to capitalize a few words. So that is something, make sure you always verify and validate the data that's coming in and clean it up whenever you can. So that is that is it. That I mean we we have a fully functional API parsing application here. We're taking in data, we're storing the data locally and then from there we are rendering it out. Now, in the final version, there are a few other refactors and I'll zoom in to make it a little easier to see and definitely feel free to look at those. I did some things like, and it would take too long, we're just about out of time to show you all of it, but uh, the functionality doesn't change at all. Everything we did is there, but notice here is the final version of the app function, this or the app component. Notice here where we keep posts and our state and everything in the app file. In the final version, I show how you can create a dedicated component called posts. And then inside of there, post holds all of the logic. 
I also show how you can build some API response handlers. So that the same API call right here, where I'm calling Axios and then calling then and then at doing our checks and setting our loaders, doing all that kind of stuff. Well, you can actually create functions that take that data in. And here is the API call. It gets taken down all the way to look like this. And then lastly, I show how to create an API utility function. So instead of having to call Axios and to put the entire URL inside of that API call, I show that you can create a function, export it, then set some base parameters. So this is something that happens a lot where you don't want to have to say that you're calling this API endpoint hundreds of times in your application. And the only thing that changes is what happens after the dot com. That would be really bad looking code. So what you can do is you can create a base API function that establishes things like the base state. You can also put in your authentication credentials in here. You can do all kinds of things right in this function. And then from there, whenever you want to call that, whenever you need to make an API call, then you simply can call API and then pass in the extension, that path extension, and then everything else there can automatically happen. So that is it. Definitely feel free to go through that full version and uh, get an idea for how you, you know, some of the other kind of more advanced types of techniques. That code that is in the final version, that is almost identical to just about all of the code that I write on a daily basis. So when it comes to things like being able to work with APIs, getting data from outside sources, rendering them on the screen, once you can get to the point where your programs can look like that, you actually are building out full production ready types of applications. So you're already there, which is pretty cool.